In today's episode of Overcritical, we're going to be talking about The Northman with Professor Matthias Norvig of the University of Colorado. Be warned, this will contain full spoilers for the entire movie. Today with me on the show is uh, Matthias Nordvig. I'm pronouncing that right. Uh, he is uh, a professor of um, Nordic studies at the University of Colorado. Um, you have a PhD in the subject. You've written a lot about it. Um, and from what I understand, you're uh, you're actually from the region as well. Mm -hmm. if, yeah. So. Um, yeah. Yeah, just uh, let's start out with a little bit of background on yourself. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. No, I uh, I've uh, written a PhD on Nordic mythology, um, mostly focused on how Nordic mythology in uh, Viking Age and medieval Iceland intersects with the environment, and in particular narrates experiences of volcanic eruptions in different ways. Hmm. Um, but aside from that, I also work with uh, modern and contemporary interpretations of uh, Nordic mythology and the use of the Viking Age in different ways. I've worked a little bit on a different um, sort of like a, what you could call the, the alt-right interpretations and mm -hmm. uh, and and uh, um, reception of uh, of uh, Nordic mythology I've all, uh, also worked with um, uh, and am working with uh, um, music in particular and how different types of like pagan or pagan-esque bands whatever you want to call them mm -hmm. are are using nordic mythology in their music and uh, you know essentially being inspired by a um a a fan base that is um that is like uh you know, neo-pagan more or less, like or neo-pagan leaning in their interests, and then uh, vice versa. Also, actually generating more and more media and culture around that subject in and of itself. So, those are some of the things that I have worked with and am working with over the years. Um, so, yeah, yeah, that angle about how um, Norse mythology interacts with um, the environment and like volcanoes especially um that's a really interesting angle to take on it um mm. i i did not get the chance to scroll through your dissertation i'm not even sure if there's a copy available online um but uh what was like your general argument i guess i'm just curious about that because it's an interesting angle yeah so first of all um <clears throat> um it it's important to sort of uh, know that in, in the study of Old Norse mythology uh, and pre-Christian Scandinavian religion, um, uh, there's been a dominating trend of reading myths uh, purely as, uh, as, as social narratives. So basically ignoring the physical world around <laughs> the people who may or may not have been telling these stories to each other. Yeah. Um, and, um, and, and I was essentially inspired by um, indigenous studies and especially uh, studies on the meaning of place and the confluence between place and mythic narration in different ways in uh, Australia, New Zealand, um, uh, Polynesia, uh, the, the entire sort of like South Pacific, essentially. And so I started looking at um, stories that were in, in various ways narrating the experience of, of 
places and spaces in mm. in various um, population groups, um, whatever I could actually get my hands on, more or less, uh, from from a you know a Scandinavian library, <laughs> which is not yeah. always the best, right? On on that kind of stuff, <laughs> obviously, um, and. Um, and I got really taken with this subject of, of geo mythology is is what it is called in in modern terms. Mm. So this idea that um, that that certain myths may have their etiology, their origin in um, some geologic event, and this is where it gets a little iffy because we have a lot of baggage in, in Northern Europe. Mm -hmm. um, and in Europe in general, when it comes to interpreting myths as as stories that are basically telling us something about the physical world in different ways. This is called nature myth mythology. Um, it was placed in an anthropological, early anthropological hierarchy as one of like the earliest stages of, of, of human uh, uh, religions. And then, you know, from that perspective in, you know, this was like back in the late 1700s and early mm -hmm. uh, um, uh, 1800s and uh, throughout the 1800s, essentially, um, you know, these these ideas were applied to different, you know, um, ideas of like levels of civilization and where do different peoples fit in. And, you know, the whole racist hierarchy that came with that. Yeah. Right? So 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 there's an there's an aspect of that that um, where uh you know early europeans uh, by anthropologists in this time period were interpreted as more primitive and therefore had these like uh nature mythological stories about the world and the best example of this is uh of course the idea that um, everything is about the sun and sun worship yeah and, yeah right so you can always find some interpretation of say boulder in Nordic mythology as a sun god yeah. and Odin as a sun god and pretty much everybody's a sun god. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> because that's sort of like what what they assumed was 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 the 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 the, the, the most um dominating uh force in the universe. And right. that's obviously not true. Um but um but yeah, then later on in the early uh, 20th century, we have the uh, sociological turn, you know, where we start focusing more on on, on the social reality of, of, of the myths. Mm -hmm. And and I wouldn't say that what I'm doing is like going back to something. What I'm what, what I've been doing is essentially um, integrating a uh, an aspect of the physical world into uh, uh, the analysis of myth in primarily in Iceland, um, but in the North Atlantic in general, actually. Yeah. I also, aside from focusing on volcanoes, also focused on the ocean and its importance in, in Old Norse mythology. Because if you know anything about Scandinavia, I know that you know, maybe the popular idea of Scandinavia is like these pristine mountains full of snow and then you got a bunch of woods and you know some biking fighting a bear i don't know right. <laughs> <laughs> but actually a lot more uh of of scandinavia is coastline yeah and mm -hmm. that is that is the one thing that has really dominated scandinavian culture up until very recently um ships and sailing you can go back to the bronze age you know almost five thousand years ago you can see carvings of uh um, or three thousand years ago, and you can see carvings of of um, of, of ships uh, on you know rocks in Scandinavia. It's very always been part of 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 Scandinavian life. So obviously, I was like looking for for that in the mythology as well. Um, and then I latched on to this subject of volcanoes and the influence on, uh, of volcanoes on mythology. In, in particularly in context of Iceland, because they have volcanoes, mm -hmm. uh, unlike the rest of Scandinavia. My premise was essentially, well, we have a bunch of Vikings who go to, uh, to Iceland in the late 700s or, or early 800s, and they're not familiar with volcanic eruptions and earthquakes. It doesn't happen in Scandinavian mainland. Mm -hmm. And then all of a sudden, they are faced with some of the biggest volcanic eruptions that we know historically in Iceland. Um, in the 930s, there's a massive volcanic er eruption in Iceland that 
you know, presumably was contributing to famine as far away as China hmm. in this time period. So it was a huge eruption that shrouded the northern hemisphere in in um, in ashes. And and I was like, well. There's got to be something in the record <laughs> right. about this. Yeah, I know, yeah. <laughs> but there isn't. There isn't like uh, there, there isn't like a reference uh, here or there in 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 like the the more accessible literature. Hmm. But then when you start digging, you actually do find different references to volcanic eruptions, different references to uh, geological disruption of locations and that kind of stuff. And you can compare that with. Uh, you know, visions of fire giants with flaming swords mm -hmm. uh, um, splitting the sky in parts and that kind of stuff yeah. in the mythology. And there you go. There's something that actually looks like, you know, these more mythological references to experiences of mm -hmm. volcanic eruptions. So that's how I landed on that. And, um, and um, yeah, you know, just went with it. And... Um, Essentially, ended up with a uh, conclusion that the uh, early Icelandic society was probably probably was highly influenced by um, the experience of such devastating volcanic eruptions, and that that actually generated a much more violent and competitive warrior society than we would have seen in the mainland Scandinavia. Interesting. Yeah, it's um. That's this. This is what we see in in other cultures as well. We there's there are hints of this in um, uh, the Maring culture in uh, Papua New Guinea, and also a fairly unknown culture in the Jamaquaque uh, Valley in Ecuador, hmm. where you basically see relatively peaceful societies. Then all of a sudden they get uh, more or less destroyed by a massive volcanic eruption. And then their descendants become very aggressive uh, resource extractors, so to speak, mm -hmm. not just in terms of hunting and farming and farming multiple resources, but also, you know, having um, ritual cycles, for instance, where they, um, they have some kind of like ritualistic and mythological reasoning for why they need to go raid their neighbors. And the interesting thing is that you can refer that back to the experience of volcanic eruptions. Hmm. So, you know, and that's the thing, right? Like yeah. As human beings, we, we try to find some kind of logical connection between things, right? We try to understand why did this mountain all of a sudden punish us with fire? Mm -hmm. Like that, that does doesn't really seem logical to a human being that has never seen, you know, molten rock before. Right. And so it's like, okay, so there's got to be some kind of reason. And if you go to the Maring uh, in um, uh, near Mount Oipo, which is the main volcano that they're focused on, it, it seems like they have attached this uh, their experiences of volcanic eruptions to. Um, to the number of these marsupials that, that, that are like semi domesticals that live around them. Hmm. So when the number of marsupials become too high, they start slaughtering them. They go into ritual cycles and then they also start raiding their neighbors as a way to sort of probably gather resources to yeah, bolster their defense against the yeah. volcanic eruption again. So my theory is essentially that Icelandic society in, in his early stages was something like this as well, where you had these very aggressive landholders who uh, um, aggressively extracted resources from their land and their neighbors. And this becomes a, a part of the so social fabric of Iceland to the extent that you go from this, you know, some call it a democracy, but it was essentially an oligarchy where you have landholders who own land and also decide things at a general assembly. You don't have a king. But, you know, over time, the amount of landholders shrinks. And in the, we start out with 40-something, in, in, at least according to legend, in the 900s when the general assembly is, is founded. Um, and then we're down to seven in the early 1200s. Hmm. So seven yeah. families as opposed to 40 something. 
they definitely weeded out their competition. Yeah, right? <laughs> for sure. Yeah. Um, and like around the 1200s, would that have been um, like around the time that the uh, Scandinavian areas were like starting to come into contact a bit more with like the more uh, Anglo Anglo-Saxon areas or... Am I oh, that, that up? Yeah, no, the, the, the contact with the English areas persisted from at least the 400s or even before. So, so oh, okay. um, yeah, I mean, the uh, the Anglo-Saxons originate sort of in uh, the southern parts of my homeland, Denmark. So, okay. Um, but, and, and you know, the, there's, it's this, there's this tendency to represent the Viking Age. It's like this age where all of a sudden Scandinavians discover the rest of Europe. Right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And that's not how it happened. Yeah. Right? There was plenty of, of interaction, you know, go back to the, the, the bronze age that I mentioned before, and you'll see that, you know, Scandinavians are trading with Egypt. So, mm. so there's, there's plenty of contacts uh, across the European continent. We just like this narrative of like, all of a sudden, these Vikings that just like burst out of the gates of Scandinavia and then start pillaging all over Europe. That's right. not really what happened. Yeah, yeah, and like, <laughs> um, and like, probably the first really big piece of Viking-related media, like at least in the West, that has really contributed to this boom of Viking entertainment was the History Channel show Vikings, and. Um, I've only seen the first season, but that is like how the show starts out. Like you have yeah. the uh, the main character Ragnar Lothbrok, uh, and he's like he's trying to convince everyone to come with him to explore more of the world. And you really get the sense that like they really have been very self isolated. But um, mm -hmm. it, uh, I guess that's just not the case. And you see that like over and over again in these yeah. uh, these uh, uh, Viking I mean, stories. Because yeah, this is because the Anglophone interest in, in Vikings mirrors the Anglophone colonization of North America, right? Mm. Like this idea that there's a land to the west. Like I think actually Arachna Lothbrok says this. <laughs> there's, there's probably a land to does, the west. I think he does, yeah. Right? And we should go there. And and this is this is how contemporary ideas of of you know white identity in, in North America are mixed in with the uh, representation and exploration too of of the Viking Age, right? Um, we know for a fact that, uh, as I mentioned before, the the Angles and uh, the Jutes were part of uh, the um, those who became the Anglo Saxons, right? And the Saxons are then uh, the other group. The 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 Angles and the Jutes, they come from what is like old Danish uh, core territory. Mm -hmm. I actually technically belong to that tribe called the Jutes myself because mm -hmm. I'm from Jutland. And uh, they migrated over with the Saxons in the 400s and then they established these uh, different kingdoms in what is now England. And um, they maintained relations and, and connections um, in different ways, very, very closely with the uh, Scandinavia up until they converted to Christianity in the middle of the 600s. Mm -hmm. And then after the 600s, the Christianity sort of um, a, puts a, a bit of a roadblock for, for between uh, the, the British Isles and Scandinavia in the sense that, um, and this becomes more prevalent later on, but, 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 Early on, um, they they're they're not too keen on on trading with non Christians, you know. Yeah. And so, um, what we see, for instance, in the Viking Age in the eight hundreds, is that a lot of Scandinavians become not baptized but prim signed, and that is a sort of like a first step towards baptism, where you can actually you can stop there, and that, that is sort of sufficient enough for you to be. Not Christian, but Christian enough that the Christians will trade with you. Mm. <laughs> so, 
yeah that's how we also get a lot of actually you know syncretic religion happening in the in mm -hmm. that time period and, and a lot of inspiration from christianity seeps into that late paganism that you know exists in scandinavia up until around the year thousand mid thousands when scandinavia is sort of like fully converted to christianity at mm -hmm. that point so so there's there's a consistent interaction in different ways christianity as i said is a little bit of a roadblock but there's still trade going on. And when we start seeing those famous raids like Lindisfarne in 793 and, and the raids on Iona and all the other monasteries and so on, that seems to be, you know, actually a, a it's sort of like a new military development probably based on, on supply issues. Um, because earlier on you have sort of more peaceful trade, supply issues, and perhaps also taxation. You know that there's a there's a report on a a party of of Scandinavians presumably who who are trading in the Dover area, if I remember correctly, in southern England, in the 750s maybe, if I remember correctly. Mm -hmm. Um, so, so a decent amount of time before Lindisfarne and they end up killing the local sheriff there because he seems to be, uh, demanding unreasonable taxation from them. And this could have been, you know, maybe it's a, a measure to, you know, uh, deter pagans from trying to trade, uh, with the English at that time. Mm. May, we don't really know the, the full context, but it's interesting to consider that that might actually be sort of like the initial uh, situation that then snowballs into a more aggressive strategy from Scandinavian side. Right. Yeah. You know, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> because all of a sudden they're being taxed more. Right. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, the Viking Age as such is much more about trade and trade networks than mm -hmm. it is about you know conquest or colonization and that kind of stuff because what you have is a breakdown of trade networks in the mediterranean uh, so so you know if you're in france or you're in england all of a sudden you have supply issues for all the cool things that you want from the middle east well where can you go you can go north right mm -hmm. you can use the scandinavians because they have these really really awesome technologically very advanced boats that are capable of uh going uh into the open sea but also going into river systems and you can even relatively easily uh pick them up and then move them from one river to another mm -hmm. which is what they're doing in 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 the russian river systems and so they you you see how then you have a bunch of little magnates and chieftains and petty kings or whatever in the Scandinavian region who are essentially just like amassing wealth to the extent where they can buy an entire army and then they can go conquer that place over there that they yeah. used to trade with, which is exactly what they do in the middle of the 800s mm -hmm. when we have the so-called great heathen army that culminates in the creation of the Dane law, whatever that was. I mean, that was in some way or other, a region where Scandinavians were allowed to settle, um, which we can see in the massive amount of place names in, mm -hmm. in eastern and northern England. So, so that's a bit of a rundown of the actual history behind the, the Viking Age that yeah. isn't you know, drenched in, in contemporary ideology. <laughs> right, yeah. And, and like it really is important important to establish that because like we have briefly touched on the um the viking age in contemporary thought and in media representation is of the mighty conqueror like mm -hmm. you see that vikings do farm but you rarely ever see them trade with others in these mm. shows and movies it's always that they raid villages and gather slaves and just make other people do these things for them um which obviously is not the case historically um and uh you can see how that does contribute to like the um 
sort of far right myth making of like the um, the strong man, the strong conqueror who is uh, capable of going to other places and taking what they want, but also capable of defending against invaders um, mm-hmm. as well. Um, and so uh, that is what I found a bit interesting about the North Man is that it it hewed a lot more closely to actual historical fact than a lot of other Viking um, uh, media has, at least to my understanding. Um, I know that the uh, the director, Robert Eggers, like he really went out of his way to try to get um, as historically accurate as possible. Of course, he is not 100%, uh, of course, but um, the that is what I found interesting is that how it kind of subverts those myths a little bit, um, subverts those expectations that we have come to see about uh, Viking media. Um, Mm -hmm. Like the big raid scene that we see in the the trailer and the one shot of Alexander Skarsgård drenched in blood and like he's got this huge six pack and he's got the two axes in his hand. Like that's the peak like Viking image. But Mm -hmm. that scene only lasts maybe five minutes. And for the rest of the movie, his character Amleth has like a dopey bowl cut and he's Mm -hmm. like in like these rags and like you don't really see his muscles anymore. And like he's still strong, but like he's he's been turned into a slave. He's not a strong strong conqueror anymore he's been conquered um yeah so i'm uh, assuming that you've seen the movie yourself as well Mm -hmm. yeah uh so what did you think of it so i have i I think you're you're very right about what um like this there's a of all the viking fiction that you can find out there this is the one that comes closest to elements of a historical reality and i say elements of a historical right. reality because there's some there's some parts of it too that you could criticize heavily mm-hmm. for for being weirdly ahistorical or just like improbable like spoiler alert <laughs> the showdown at the, the, the naked showdown on the volcano right yeah. like, like, i mean that, that that was like that really annoyed me because <laughs> i'm like sitting there like their skin would have like fallen off at this right point. <laughs> but but you know uh, this is one of the the great qualities of, of robert eggers as a director he um when he makes historical fictions of some kind, he does a lot of intense research. And this is what I really loved about The Witch, for mm-hmm. instance. Um, he had even, in that movie, used, um, uh, um, uh, like, I think it was court documents and, and folklore to to create some of the dialogue, like, which is just like, really cool yeah and in the same way he he did a a lot of research and worked with some really good historians on on this uh um uh, on on all this research uh for instance archaeologist neil price and uh johanna katrin friedrichsdottir from uh um, the university of iceland um to 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 create a fiction that is believable at least from the point of view of, of, of saga narratives, mm-hmm. as we know them, the stories that were written about, you know, Vikings, right? Um, so, so what we see is, is for instance, um, a lot of sort of uh, religious um, scenery um, that that comes very close to what I, as 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 a scholar of this stuff, would say. This is this is historically believable. This, this is something I can get down with. Um, and also, you know, uh, things that have to do with power and the power of, of, of the magnates. Mm-hmm. And in the, the early scenes in the movie where you see them all assembled in the hall and they're holding up their rings as, as a token of their loyalty to, uh, to the king or chieftain or whatever he is, right? So that all of that stuff, I, I I really enjoyed. I really also enjoyed the um, 
the 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 costumes and the jewelry and so on um like nerdy detail for instance when they're down in that you know underground hole beneath the uh um the the temple where you know this it's this initiation ritual where they're mm -hmm. supposed to be like the, the father and son they're like you know pr pretending to be wolves or yeah, animals yeah. of some kind we just get a glimpse of these little golden foils that are like lying in the dirt um beneath them and those are the so-called gulgupa um that's that's um swedish norwegian word that means golden dude <laughs> because <laughs> it's, it, it's the, these little uh they're not they're smaller than a stamp um golden foils usually with a little warrior or a man or a woman huh. or an animal or something imprinted on them and you find them all over scandinavia from the viking age and from before the viking age as well thousands of them in in the ground in these temple buildings that we have uncovered since the 90s up until the 90s 1990s we didn't assume that there were actually temple buildings as such but then we realized that we just needed to look for them. <laughs> and, no, and they you don't were there. Say. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, and and so we don't know what these Gulgupa were used for. There are plenty of theories out there. Some have been saying that they're for fertility, but that doesn't explain the weird trolls and other weird demons that are carved in some of them or, mm. or printed in some of them. So we don't actually know. But in that movie, we get a scholars best bid on how they were used like they 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 are in that space where they're doing this initiation ritual in that same scene we also have quoting from the Havamal, right the, this long long poem about viking ethics that is presumably recited by odin himself so historically very very awesome like if you ask me i think that's so cool um and I would also say, knowing a little bit about the um, the uh, um, the other people that have been involved with this movie, we have the author Shon, Icelandic author, um, who's written multiple books and movie manuscripts. Um, he has also left his distinct mark on this movie. Um, he's the author of a, a really cool, actually one of my favorite stories called The Blue Fox. Um, and well, lo and behold, there's a blue fox in this uh, <laughs> in the movie oh, as really? well. Yeah, uh, shows up in Iceland, uh, of course. And the blue fox. That's right. In, yeah, 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 yeah. Thinking about it, I think it was at nighttime too, so like it was a bit hard to see that, uh, yeah. like the color. But yeah, wow, huh? <laughs> yeah, it's a. I mean, the the, the bluish uh, coat is simply an Arctic fox when it's you know summertime, right? So, oh yeah, so that, yeah, that's what it is. Yeah, okay. but the 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 funny thing is that this story that uh, he's written uh, called the Blue Fox, <clears throat> which I would strongly recommend that anybody reads, um, is about witchcraft and it is about uh, sort of like deep magic in Iceland. Mm -hmm. um, it's sort of like a typical magical realism story back when that was like a a, a fancy thing. You know the life of Pi and all that stuff, right? Yeah, <laughs> that was that was like a brief moment in, in in movie history too, I guess. Yeah, we need to go back to that. <laughs> the, some yeah. of it was really cool, mm -hmm. you know. Um, Lars von Trier's Antichrist, the great example of cool magical realism. So. I still haven't seen that, although I hear that uh, Willem Dafoe, who's also in The Northman, is mm -hmm. uh, just stellar in that movie. He is. He is. It's a great movie. Yeah, really, really cool. So yeah, I mean, um, it's, it's, it, these the qualities of, of the director, the manuscript uh, authors, these scholars, the producers, all come together and and make a really interesting movie. And um, I guess the, my my main criticism about it is that it is still so focused on violence, you know. In so many ways, this is still just the narrative that we're we're talking, uh, we're giving about Vikings, that 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 that's what they can do, violence, mm -hmm. and it's you know, I, <laughs> so to us Scandinavians, the Viking Age is a time period 
where our countries become countries, right? So for my country in particular, Denmark, we, at the height of the Viking age, we become Christianized mm -hmm. or converted to Christianity. And there's a huge monument in the middle of Denmark for that raised by a Viking king, right? The so-called yelling stone. Uh, doesn't mean anything to do with yell, but the, yeah. <laughs> the, the location is yelling. It's a small small town nowadays. Uh, this this Viking king named Harold Bluetooth, he built a sort of like palace structure, um, complete with palisades and a huge Viking hall and burial mounds, you know, for his father and. And then he put up this huge stone where he carved an image of Christ, uh, of Christ on one side. Um, and then he carved runes that said that uh, he had now converted the, the, the Danes to Christianity. And he had conquered Norway. It's also something he claims on that stone. <laughs> so that's the 960s when he raises this stone. Hmm. Um, <clears throat> you know, 30 years later, you have another Viking king who converts... Norway to Christianity and there are rune stones that are raised to commemorate uh, some of that as well uh, on Kule in, in Norway mm -hmm. and um, in the same way in Iceland you have the foundation of Iceland, you have the foundation of the General Assembly and so on so to us Scandinavians the Swedes are a little iffy they're, they're a little later with some of these things mm -hmm. and not so coherent as a country uh, uh, in, in this Viking era that comes a little later for them but but still still the same time period essentially same type of culture that exists and generates what then becomes the medieval culture which we as scandinavians consider the basis for our modern culture and sure. ways. okay so consider that for a second consider if um if you as an american you uh, you know Look back to the founding of your country in the 1770s, uh, the Revolutionary Wars, um, <clears throat> George Washington and all that stuff. And you were like, this is this is what I come from. This is uh, this is my identity. And then, you know, uh, everybody else in the entire world represents that time period as a bunch of half naked psychopaths. <laughs> <laughs> like, I, mean, it, I mean i don't know i like if you watch mel gibson's the patriot it's not far off you know no like, it yeah. might be true but mel gibson isn't is really that, a, a like, font of historical knowledge yeah yeah but 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 you see what i mean right it, yeah it's, it's it's a uh, for scandinavians the viking age is like a civilizing moment and for everybody else it's something to project their uncivilized fantasies onto hmm. right and and that's that's just a little curious right it's yeah. just a little weird <laughs> um and and what we see in that Viking age, right, in that time period, is that Scandinavia goes from being the outer rim of Europe to becoming included into the European community in a sense, right, with Christianity, but also with various types of institutions, mainly based on Mediterranean culture, uh, that, like, you know, Monasticism, for instance, we get monasteries, mm -hmm. we get hospitals, we get um, royal power, all of this stuff that we now refer to as Europeanization in context of the Viking mm -hmm. Age. So the Scandinavians become Europeanized. And, and that's a significant moment. This is the time period, or this is the situation where you take sort of like the biggest civilizational leap um in in scandinavian history the only one that is bigger is the industrialization and, and modern age mm -hmm. right so 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 that's a very very different perspective on what the viking age actually is yeah. and then what we always see is, is these narratives they tend to just take like, focus on a bunch of axe throwing and and, and apps yeah <laughs> well like and it's interesting to say that in the context of the Northman too, because if I'm not mistaken, uh, this story is um, 
like the original myth that William Shakespeare would end up basing Hamlet off of. So it's mm-hmm. not like a story that has been written from nothing and is really only informed by um, the popular interpretation of Vikings. Like it actually has um, some history to it. And yet, like you've said, it still does focus heavily on the um, the violence and the screaming visuals that we all know about, like Viking and the Berserker Warrior. And, um, and so like, it's, it, it's an interesting movie in the sense that it subverts some historical inaccuracies that a lot of popular Viking media has fallen to, but then it also still falls into that same trap. Um, yeah. And like, I don't think that it was anything purposeful on the director's part, but it's interesting how Viking media can't seem to escape that either. Um, so yeah this is a really interesting question and especially this like how purposeful was it mm -hmm. um because again (laughs) the uh uh the original story about amleth is from uh saxo's history of the danes and you know presumably uh, Amleth's original grave is like right down the road from where my mom lives. <laughs> well, all right. <laughs> yeah. So it, Saxo, uh, this Danish historian who's writing in the late 1100s mm-hmm. uh, and early 1200s, he he gives us a story about a uh, a, um, a a young prince who is disowned by his uh, his uncle, right, who kills his father, and then this prince. Uh, plays uh, stupid or 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 insane, and so that's how he escapes being killed by his uncle himself. Mm-hmm. And then he um, is sent off to his uncle's as family members or, or buddies. I can't remember in England, and he comes over there with a little rune stick where the uncle has written on it uh, or carved it, and uh, kill kill him when you meet him. Mm-hmm. But uh, Amleth is smart. He, you know, cuts off these runes and then he writes some other runes about how they should, uh, uh, I don't know, give him an army or something <laughs> like that. Then he tours the English countryside, uh, um, vanquishes some Scots, I think it is, and then you know eventually comes back and, and gains the, the kingdom and all that stuff. Mm-hmm. Um, and and it's set in Denmark and England, and. Um, there are theories about how this was originally an Icelandic story, but there's like really no evidence that it was. Mm. Um, so, so you have to ask yourself if you know anything about Danish geography, you know, first of all, that there is nothing awe inspiring and Viking about it. <laughs> it's, um, it's kind of like Iowa with a coastline, you know, nice rolling hills. Um, really really beautiful beaches in in many ways at least in the summertime um and then you know a little bit of forest here and there and marshlands Mm -hmm. but not that you know icy rocks with with a blizzard in the background and all that stuff that you see in the movie right so in the movie the northman the setting is more sort of like norwegian northwest coast Mm -hmm. right and the only the only part of, of of Scandinavia and the Viking world is that was historically part of the Viking Age, right? Uh, that isn't mentioned is actually Denmark. <laughs> we have a reference to Sweden. We have Russia. Right? Huh. Uh, I guess England is also not really uh, relevant at any point. And then of course they end up going to Iceland mm-hmm. uh, at the end. And so that uh, my point here is that you can find a um, is sort of a um, more or less uh, word for word, scene for scene uh, um, remake of Saxo's original story in Royal Deceit with Christian Bale from the '90s. I think it is. It's a it's a it's a cool historical movie because it's so uh, trying to be so historically accurate mm-hmm. and and true to the original story. Uh, but it's also incredibly boring for that same reason, <laughs> <laughs> right? <laughs> so, so 
my, my point is here that the, um, that what we're seeing in the Northmen is that some probably some very deliberate uh, uh, choices have been made to play into this Viking stereotype. The Viking stereotype is always some dude uh, dressed in in some kind of skin. Mm-hmm. Uh, standing on a icy, stony northern coast somewhere, with uh, this uh, stormy uh, uh, North Atlantic Ocean and 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 all that stuff, and then you know, then he ends up fighting people on a volcano. Yeah. <laughs> well, you literally just described one of the promotional materials for the movie. Uh, uh, yeah, yeah, I guess like I it's Amleth <laughs> is standing with his back to the camera, like he's silhouette. He's on a cliffside, looking at the ocean. He's got axes in his hand. I think he might be wearing the skin that he briefly wears. Um, and yeah, like that's literally what you just described. Yes, so, right. Yeah, and that plays that. That's the stuff that plays into the Viking stereotype. Mm-hmm. Now. Um, and you know, then you can start picking apart other aspects of that Viking stereotype. You know, he's usually blonde. He's usually bearded. He's mm-hmm. usually got long hair. Um, he's jacked up, um, and, and all that stuff. And if you compare that with what we actually know historically um, from various kinds of sources, then that image will fall apart. Mm-hmm. Genetically, for instance, we have. Uh, confirmation that um, plenty of Vikings were a lot more dark haired and actually uh, the Viking age is the time period where Scandinavians are mixing more and more with uh, Southern Europeans and oh, yeah. people from Asia mm-hmm. and, and so on. We have, you know, literary reports on non-white Scandinavians too. Um, so, so there is a presence of, we, we can't say, say exactly if they are from, you know, maybe from Africa or Asia, but there is some presence of non-whites in Scandinavia mm-hmm. in the Viking age. And that's nothing, that's something that you never see really. Right. Actually, there is a little bit of it in, in, in Vikings. There's a, there's a, you know, some, 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 someone is from China at some point, I think. Well, like and in we the, the, um, so oh yeah, there. I think you were about to talk about the new one. Uh, yeah, yeah, Vikings Valhalla, yeah. where you have this uh, this what is it, she's black actress, right? Yes. Um, yeah. Like I'm not sure, what? like specifically where her character is from, but yes, I do remember yeah. hearing like a like there's this huge controversy among it with the fans because like there was no such thing as black Vikings, and like you heard the same thing with like The Witcher and like mm. that casting where you had actors of color in certain roles and which like, is, is essentially completely a fantasy universe exactly <laughs> exactly like, like that's the thing okay. that you're picking a bone with yeah so um yeah right. no so so when it comes to the subject uh, i mean obviously we we can perhaps not assume that there are many uh uh non-white sure. individuals yeah. in scandinavia at the time period but there is something to indicate that that, that there was some here and there mm-hmm. um and you know, like p- people sometimes ask me these questions, like, "Oh, when when do we see uh, um, um, people from uh, other parts of the world showing up in Northern Europe, um, people with other skin colors, and so on?" And I, what I usually tell tell people who ask me those kinds of things, I say, "Look, there's always been a non-white population in Europe. You can." pretty much drop down in any time period and then you will will find you know that medieval portugal has a bunch of africans <laughs> you know right yeah yeah <laughs> uh or or go go to uh, early christian england and you'll see that oh wait there's an a, a bishop from north africa over here in mm-hmm. the corner or um go even go back to the hunters gatherer <clears throat> stone age and you'll find that uh the 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 phenotype or whatever you call that of 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 uh, northwestern europeans was dark skinned with blue eyes um and this is, will always piss off some some racists in right. somewhere and um and that's just how it is but um 
but that's that's just one thing to keep in mind that there is some you know diversity in it in appearance in the Viking Age, which is never represented, mm -hmm. or you know only in in, in very uh, very few cases is it represented, um, and and in the same way um, we're 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 talking about a, a vast territory, you know, like I think from the northern part of of scandinavia to the southern part of scandinavia is something like the distance from new york to miami like it's it's pretty 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 big yeah it's huge <laughs> yeah 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 and then you know the uh uh then you have the north atlantic expanse so obviously there's not a lot of land there and there's the faroe islands the shetlands the orkneys uh, uh iceland of course and then greenland Greenland is the size of a third of the United States, uh, at least the continent, the, continent, the, the, the four, con, what do you call it? The contiguous 48 yeah. states, right? Um, a third of them, that's, that's the size of Greenland, right? And Greenland from the north to the south mm -hmm. is from, from Vancouver to Tijuana. Yeah, so, it's huge. You know, it is huge. Um, and and then you have interactions with all kinds of peoples. There are multiple ethnicities in Scandinavia in this time period too. You have Germanic-speaking Scandinavians. I wouldn't call them Swedes and Danes and Norwegians at this point because they, they haven't fully become that yet. Mm -hmm. um, you you have various local tribes um, that are slowly coming together as as uh, under under a king so in sort of more m monarchical um, um institutional uh, situations mm -hmm. and so on um but they definitely see differences between each other they also see similarities then you have the sami in the in in this in central scandinavia in northern scandinavia um who speak an entirely different language um have uh, very different ways of, of of living and subsisting. They're nomadic usually, hunters, fishers more than they are farmers. You know, this, the uh, Germanic speaking Scandinavians they are farming more than than fishing and hunting. Obviously, we're dealing with mixed economies, so right. so they do a little bit of both here and there. You have Finns. You have a bunch of different kinds of Finns. You have. You know, Western Finns, you have Karelian Finns, you have Ingrian Finns, and so on. You have s some Slavic peoples as well. You have influence from what is now Estonia and Latvia and Lithuania on, you know, Scandinavia. Um, there's likely to be some Slavic, or you know that there is Slavic pre presence in in the Danish area and in southern Sweden. Mm -hmm. Um, there are plenty of individuals uh, that have been identified in the Viking Age who have come from Poland, what is now Poland, and um, the North German coast, which is populated by Slavic tribes at the time. Um, aforementioned Harold Bluetooth married a Slavic princess, for instance. And that's sort of like a pattern that these you know, <clears throat> Scandinavian kings do over and over. Right. So the point is really... That there is a lot of ethnic diversity, there's a lot of social diversity, there's a lot of subsistence diversity in so many different ways. And that's always glossed over uh, in favor of that like blonde muscular dude with axes in his hands uh, who, who has a grudge against somebody. Right. Either because they are an English king who own land or because they, you know, stole his kingdom or something else. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so, like... I, I yeah. that is kind of what I liked about the revenge story of the movie, at least, is that like the he has that big repeated chant that he does of I will avenge you, father, I will save you, mother, I will kill you, Fjolnir. And then when he finally gets to Fjolnir, he finds that he has no lands to reclaim. Uh, mm -hmm. And then eventually he finds out that his mother was actually in on the plot to kill his father. And so um, all that he's left with is revenge for the sake of it. Like mm -hmm. Fjolnir isn't going anywhere. He's not like on the up and up in any way. He's responsible for these really barren lands. Um, and this is where I did want the story to kind of 
subvert that even further and not have Amleth like go through with his revenge. But of course he did. Um, and it's, um, it's presented as like an inescapable fate, uh, that really ties in with the mythology that's present in the film too. But I was really hoping he would just stay on that ship at the Mm -hmm. end. Uh, yeah. And, uh, and he didn't, and he chose instead uh, to get stabbed through the heart on top of a raging volcano. <laughs> so, yeah. Um, no, this this is a good point, and this is where the movie does sort of like have a another um, another point to make mm-hmm. about all of this, and this is I th- I think this is where we see. <clears throat> So like the influence of like Icelanders being very familiar with their own literature as well, because, you know, uh, you know, it's, it's when we read the sagas, we tend to miss the point. Yeah. <laughs> we always like, oh, these are cool stories about Vikings with beating each other over the head with axes. It's like, no, actually, these are stories about the breakdown of society. Mm-hmm. Because you idiots are constantly focused on revenge. Yes, yeah. <laughs> that's really what they're trying to say all the time, right? Um, this is also why the, the in, when it comes to Nordic mythology, the myth of Ragnarok is played up so much. Mm-hmm. Um, at least you know, to, to some extent, the, the the role that that story played in medieval Iceland, long after they stopped believing in the Nordic gods but they were still telling these stories. They were still writing them down. The role that it played was this, you know, fear of the breakdown of this fabric of society Mm -hmm. uh, through this cycle of revenge. And we know this from the rest of Scandinavia too. They were very focused on this in the medieval period. We have folk songs from, from the 11 and 1200s that address the subject of, you know, blood feud and revenge. And, uh, this also is part of you know the culture elsewhere in Europe, mm-hmm. and in the same way, what you also see elsewhere in Europe is that you know the powers that be, the church, the king, whoever it is, are trying to root that out of society. And you can go into a long analysis of like the monopoly of violence in that regard. I mean, it's kings who are you know trying to impose their rule of law mm-hmm. onto society, and so they can't have this old system of feuds being being the most common way of settling your disputes. Right. You have to go to the local assembly that is now, you know, ruled by the king, you know, in in the form of his um, sheriff or whatever you want to call it, right? Uh, so, so there's that to it as well. But in Iceland, what we're seeing is definitely this, um, it is like a, a attempt to put the brakes on this feuding society Mm -hmm. and you know the time when these stories are most popular in um in medieval iceland is also the time period where which we are now referring to as a civil war you know this is this is snurri stutlson and basically his other family members who are fighting each other over who's going to become the duke of iceland when the norwegian king takes over Mm -hmm. right they already know that in the you know, the, the 1220s and 30s and 40s. And then, you know, it happens in the 60s. Yeah. So so um, when we go to the movie, what we see is, is sort of like the same message. The same message mm-hmm. is that, you know, you, you not have not really gained anything from this, you know, vengefulness, this, this, this um bloodthirsty feud like you all you got was you killed a bunch of people and you got some awesome imagery out of it (laughs) (laughs) i mean it does look cool when they're fighting on the volcano it does it does that was a really uh visually interesting way to to have a final duel uh it it actually kind of reminded me of the final duel in the star wars revenge of the sith between oh yeah 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 yeah. uh (laughs) But I think uh, the Northman did it a little slightly better. But yeah, yeah. Um, and I guess uh, it. How do I word this? Like with what you were saying 
earlier about how if like American stories told elsewhere in the world were all defined by the revolutionary area, uh, like how all these Scandinavian stories of the Viking age are all defined by just that one era. Um, I actually think what appeals to so many people, especially out here in the West, especially to uh, these far right groups is that it focuses on those things that um, the American stories would focus on the war, the sort of, um, uh, victorious revolution aspect, although we don't really quite see um, r- revolution stories in the the Viking media that we see today. But like, it's still it's still a battle. Um, it's a conquering of your conquerors. Um, we all know how much Americans like violence in their media. So like, like obviously these Viking stories are going to really lean heavily into that, and. Um, and so I think that's why they're so focused on this little short era in Scandinavian history and why they blow up all those elements um, uh, f- for the screen. Um, uh, but, oh, mm-hmm. Yeah, no, I, I, wanted to, I wanted to add to that, that yes, but it's also our own fault. In the sense that hmm. this is the time period that that Scandinavians have latched on to 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 be like the the glorious past, right? And it's kind of weird that that is the glorious past because you know if you look at the Dano Norwegian Empire, the glorious past was more you know in 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 like the 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 seventeen hundreds, like, and if you look at well, I mean, the, 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 you can always debate when when was the height of an empire. Sure, yeah. But, but and it's the same with the Swedes. That the Swedish Empire was also pretty, pretty damn big and cool and and all that stuff in in the sixteen and seventeen hundreds. So so it's like it's a it's a very deliberate choice to 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 hold up this particular time period and say this is uh, this is this is the time period that. That defines us and and it's the coolest part of our history mm. right um i don't know i mean you know uh, when it comes to 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 the danes and the norwegians for instance the the 1380s and and into the 1400s it's like the time period where you have a um, well it started out with a norwegian king who married a danish princess then the Norwegian king ends up dying, and the, the Danish princess ends up becoming uh, the uh, queen of Denmark and Norway. And then the Swedes are like, well, let's try to invade. And then they thoroughly get their asses kicked. <laughs> <laughs> and then, then this, this, this queen, Queen Margaret I, ends up ruling what is essentially geographically the largest country that has ever existed in Europe. Right? Yeah. So it's like Denmark, Norway, Sweden, Finland... Uh, parts of the Baltic and like Iceland and the Faroe Islands, the Shetlands, the Orkneys and Greenland. Like it's a huge geographically, huge area. That yeah. this... <laughs> and it's like, nobody's focusing on that period. It's like, that was when we were really cool. <laughs> like right. it has to be yeah. the, those like Vikings that were like 500 years earlier. Right. Mm-hmm. And, you know, in the same way you have, you have the Swedes that are, you know, in this, in the 1700s, they're, they're kicking ass in Russia. They're kicking ass in Germany. They're kicking ass in Poland. They're kicking ass everywhere and conquering and conquering and conquering. But they're not, you know, that's not what we're talking about. Mm-hmm. It's a cool time period. So, you know, it's it's a choice, right? And in the 19th century, um, mostly because uh, we Scandinavians had gotten our asses kicked. Um, but the Danes part of was by the Germans mm-hmm. and for the Swedes part it was by the Russians. And then you have these emerging states like Norway, you know, becomes in, uh, well, it gets, gains an, a constitution under Swedish rule mm-hmm. in 1814, um, transitioning from be, having been part of the Danish uh, kingdom. 
and then gains its independence in 1905. You have Iceland that um, is cultivating an independent identity from the Danish kingdom from the early 19th century and especially in the 19, uh, 20, sorry, 1830s mm -hmm. and 70s, it goes up and down in these waves. And then finally it becomes realized as, as, a, as a sovereign uh, state in 1918 and becomes an independent republic in 1944 and this is of course really important time periods for these different countries and what they always like look back to is that the viking age mm -hmm. like, that was when we were most powerful and so so that's that's also part of cultivating um the viking as like the sort of like the the emblem of the independent and rugged individualist Scandinavian. Mm -hmm. yeah. and that is what is really appealing yeah. uh, in an American context, right? Because Absolutely. it sort of mirrors the cowboy in many ways. Yeah. That's an interesting comparison I never heard before. But yeah, I mean, um, like, especially if you take the, um, like, the rugged explorer Viking, you know, they are also traveling west across the ocean the cowboys and those settlers were traveling west across the american landscape um yeah that's an interesting comparison yeah. i've never heard before that's a great connection and i mean historically both populations also interacted with native americans right yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. so so there's there is that we know very little about how those interactions actually played out for the vikings mm -hmm. obviously we know a lot about how it it, it, it played out for Europeans colonizing this continent otherwise uh, outside of the Viking era. Um, so so th there's that as well. Um, and there are plenty of American myths about Viking ships in the Mississippi mm -hmm. and runestones, if, you know, in the Midwest and, and so on. And, you know, it's always like, where do you find them? Well, you find them where there's like a Swedish population that grows in the 19th right. century. Yeah. <laughs> like, go figure. Yeah, you'll find it there. Yeah. Yeah. It's fine. Um, so. Yeah. And I guess, like, how much do you think that choice of saying this is our golden age, like, how much do you think that is influenced or affected by... Um, what happened um, in uh, the World War II era with the Third Reich and how the Nazis kind of co-opted Norse mythology and symbolism and then for today with the far right continuing that trend. Like, why do you think that with all of that baggage, it's still looked at as like the golden era like is it an attempt to sort of reclaim that from the far right or are there elements of of um some parts of scandinavia sort of leaning into that with the far right um so this is this is a very uh, interesting and complicated history uh, you start with the brothers Grimm. In the uh, in the late 1700s and early uh, 1800s, um, we have in the 1700s a movement to define what it means to be German in in the the German uh, Empire mm -hmm. at the time, and in scholarship, what this becomes is, of course, also a pursuit to find the German identity historically. And so they're looking at uh, historical records and finding that they have very little from that pre-Christian era, right? They have a couple of Roman sources, uh, like Tacitus, for instance, uh, Caesar's uh, Gallic Wars. He talks a little bit about some Germanic peoples mm -hmm. here and there. And then, of course, we later on, we have the stories about the Goths and the Longobards and, and so on. And that becomes... Uh, you know, a backdrop for uh, scholars who are working with folklore, 
German folklore to identify what is actually German stories, right? Hmm. And what they're mostly focused on is to like uh, weed out German from romance, right? right? So, 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 so. Oh no, this this is a French w- version of Little Red Riding Hood. <laughs> we can't have that. You know, that's the kind of stuff that's happening. And uh, of course, what we are also seeing is uh, is that oh, some of these uh, folk tales they actually have uh, comparable elements to sagas to Scandinavian folk tales to uh, Old Norse mythology as well. And that's why, uh, you know, Jacob Grimm then is writing his Deutsche Mythologie, Teutonic mythology, right? Mm -hmm. Uh, Which is essentially based on Old Norse material Mm -hmm. more than anything else. And that becomes an important cornerstone in German self-identification throughout the 19th century. Now, then it gets really specific because what we also have is the uh, uh, the predominantly German Austrian kingdom in the late 19th century, where you have uh, 10 million Germans, I think it is. The other big um, uh, population group is, is about 5 million Polish. Mm-hmm. You have 3 million Czechs. A bunch of Slavic groups, a couple of like Italians here and there, and some, 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 some Slovenians, and you know, the Hungarians, and then there's like a, a tiny population of Jews um, <clears throat> who are being blamed for everything, of right. course, because it's Europe, and and you have some Romani as well um, that uh, I think some people will know as gypsies, mm-hmm. even though that's not a term that we use for them. Right. Um, so 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 in this. And and you know what I would any 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 American who's kind of worried about the current political situation in this country I would strongly recommend that you look into the history of late nineteenth century Austria because it's so so comparable. Hmm. You have um, this these this like intensified German identity well, that is usually coupled with Protestantism, but actually gets a neo pagan component to it with uh, certain thinkers or whatever you want to call them mm-hmm. Guido von Liszt for instance and Guido von Liszt is uh, is is responsible for modern runic divination he comes up with that based off of an, another racist uh, Madame Blavatsky's uh, um, writings on the secret doctrine hmm. Madame Blavatsky invents new age and uh, her new age uh, mumbo jumbo is this idea of like these stages of, of, of human development, spiritual development set in a racist hierarchy um, where the Aryans are some of the most important mm-hmm. ones and they come from the up there in the north, right? And so what does Guido van Liszt do? Well, he reads her, her book and and then he goes, well, the Aryans, that's us Germanic people and we have the runes. Mm-hmm. And the runes were actually like the main conduit to uh, Uncle Odin, who is like our spiritual uh, powerhouse, right? right? And that has like direct influence on the emergence of the Nazi party mm-hmm. and the iteration that Hitler creates it in. Um, <clears throat> there's, there's even indications that Hitler's swastika, um, or I would say that th- there's plenty of evidence that Hitler's swastika yes. actually comes from this new age movement theosophy mm-hmm. um, that, um, that Guido van Liszt turns into Ariosophy. Um, with reference to the Aryans that he believes are like the original Germans and Germanic peoples, right? Mm-hmm. And so this is also why you get that, you know, Scandin- fascination with Scandinavians uh, and Norse mythology in the Third Reich uh, during the Nazi era. But it's also important to just mention that the way that we perceive this today is strongly overblown compared to what it actually was back then and we for instance have uh, so uh, a uh, less awesome thing about my country's history and the norwegian history for that matter is that we were some of the biggest contributors to the foreign ss uh, during world war ii Hmm. 
So uh, Denmark sent, I think it was like 12,000 uh, SS soldiers uh, to fight in the Eastern Front. Mm. And um, some of the reports that you get back from these uh, SS soldiers is that they're actually incredibly um, uh, disappointed with the education that they're getting in Germany because the the Germans are focused on, you know, their ancient emperors and all that stuff, you know, uh, Barbarossa and, and so on, right? And there's very little Viking involved. So they're sitting, these Scandinavians, they're sitting there. It's like, where's our Viking heritage? Hmm. Um, and the Germans, of course, don't care about that right. because <laughs> they're building a German empire. Yeah. <laughs> um, but the Scandinavians are sort of like held up as, as, as the... The last remnants of of the Aryan race, and particularly the, the Norwegians, right? Mm -hmm. um, which is why you also find, you know, the Lebensborn project to to create a, a future Aryan race, right? Mm -hmm. Where 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 they're literally like you know, hand picking blondes in Scandinavia right. for that, yeah. Um, and and so so you have that sort of use of runes and use of some uh, uh, Norse mythology uh, elements here and there in the Third Reich that is essentially resting on a deep history of, of attempts of, of creating a German identity um, through the late 1700s and throughout the 19th century, right? And obviously the Scandinavians are doing the same thing, inspired very much by the same ideas and so on. Mm -hmm. And this is also why, you know, the Viking Age in that sense is manufactured as an era um, of, of identity making that, um, that, that defines who we are, right? Like it, 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 it al always had that potential of becoming sort of the poster boy for you know racist ideology hmm. and so 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 that's that's probably why it's still part of that mythology on the far right in in america and in europe and you can even go to south america and you can find you know racists with uh, these like attachments to vikings yeah yeah yeah. So, and and some of it actually like harkens straight back to Madame Blavatsky's ideas about the Aryans living on the North Pole and then like spreading across the globe. <laughs> you know. Oh, so, if, yeah. If, if Santa really Claus fascist. turned out to be a Nazi or something. <laughs> oh God. You never know, man. You never yeah. know. <laughs> so so yeah, no, it's actually a very very like. Uh, intricate convoluted system of myths mm -hmm. where you know some are ancient and some were made yesterday but they all sort of like circulate around the use of runes mm -hmm. as like this deep mystical symbology of 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 Aryan blood or or, or, or something like that mm -hmm. so so it's um yeah it's it's uh <clears throat> fascinating <laughs> yeah right yeah and like i i i find it really fascinating too just because it's it really is interesting to see how people can take um entire histories and make them mean something completely different uh and shape them to what they need and um that's what we're seeing here with uh, uh the far right in um in America as well. And we're like seeing, uh, we have seen some sort of like hints of it hitting the more mainstream, um, Republican circuits. Like the, the one that really sticks out to me is I believe it was the, um, big, a conservative, uh, conference C CPAC in 2020 and the stage for that, was the spitting image of the Odal rune, um, mm. which uh, has f famously been used by the Nazis and the SS, but also, of course, has a history before that. Um, 
Yeah, so, so there's a couple of things that are, that are actually, I've actually written a uh, blog post about this. Yeah. Um, it's not the Othal rune as such. It is a, uh, a, a, a what was it? The Yugoslavian SS used uh, a sort of like a a reinterpreted version of it that the it's got bent prongs and you know that yes. was never used in the uh, in in the history uh of 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 the use of runes okay. it's yeah, very yeah. new phenomenon i i i strongly doubt that that anybody knew what they were doing in that regard i think it's like a weird weird way to sub communicate <laughs> something either. i guess you have a more charitable <laughs> interpretation of it than i do but as you know, it's it's just like it it would be, it would be a, a like who are they talking to? Like those like five Aryan brotherhoods sitting out there that actually use Oda runes. I don't know. Like, I mean, like a lot of these Republican staffers have uh, like um, uh, younger people on staff. Uh, they got uh, like I think it's Paul Gosar. His staff is filled with the Groypers. Uh, who f- follow like Nick Fuentes and they're really big into memes. And so I'm sure that it's possible one staffer like was helping to design the stage and no one else knew what this meant, mm-hmm. but like, it was just kind of like a, a, a little like inside joke on their part. But like you said, it could have been entirely a coincidence. It's just like, it was one of those things that it, of course, got a lot of news articles written about it and everyone was like really mad about it on Twitter. Um, And uh, it certainly could be a problem if it's an actual dog whistle, but I'm sure that there are a bit uh, more pressing matters uh, in the rise of the fascist movement here in America than stage shapes. But yeah, Um, Yeah. it's just something I found interesting. Yeah, it is. It is interesting. Like if, if it, if it actually is, that intentionally then it's you know then then i'm like wow what the hell what what's going on right yeah it's worrying if Um, it's intentional for sure yeah yeah it's more than worrying man Mm -hmm. it's it's like really really like it's it i mean it it's like that 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 would be I don't even know what to compare it to because it would mean that that there's like this like l- tiny esoteric group, so to speak, in in society that has like managed to to take over so much of the symbolism and and politics of of a huge national party, which I just I I don't know I, I I'm I'm a little skeptical about that. Well, right, yeah, like if. If you're not careful, you can go like full Illuminati on this, uh, just like looking for symbols and stuff that really isn't there. And obviously that's not good um, because not everything is controlled by any small group of five people, either right or left, you know. But Mm -hmm. um, yeah, uh, uh, like I said, it is one of those things that like I think it may have been intentional, but at the end of the day, it's not a big deal. Um, Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. uh, Yeah. But yeah. yeah. So um, I guess the last thing that I wanted to ask for today, uh, because I'm looking at a time and we have been chatting for a while. Uh, yeah. And I love this. I've learned a hell of a lot. Um, I'd love to be in one of your courses. Uh, but um, I guess the last thing I wanted to ask is if it, if I were to make a a Viking story now, or if I was Robert Eggers during the production of The North Man, um, how can I make a better Viking story? Like, how can I still explore that era if I find it so fascinating without falling into the many traps of, um, of violence and historical inaccuracy that we have seen a lot of these mm-hmm. fall into? Like... I well, I mean, yeah. you know, the the big question is what what are uh, grand universal narratives, right? I, I think that's where we need to start. We need to, to ask ourselves what are relevant stories to tell the modern public. Mm-hmm. 
um, just like Shakespeare did. And ask himself that, right? Um, that's why he's got uh, stories about the fall of kings and mm-hmm. stories about uh, uh, love and, you know, pretty much everything in between. Um, and, you know, if you start there, then I feel like you're what you're basically doing is that you're saying, like, I want to tell a story that is universally meaningful to human beings. And it can essentially be set in whatever era um, and whatever technology is available and so on. But I want it in the Viking Age. Mm-hmm. And then you start fashioning uh, a, a, a story with that particular plot and and narrative right around a viking like for instance i i would um i would the thing is you can compare it to like what what do we know italians for or the french for we know them for love and and maybe with the french like there's like this weird um american stereotype of them being very sexually free yeah yeah (laughs) yeah Yeah. you know that kind of stuff but then you and why it's because there's a bunch of you know love stories set in italy Mm -hmm. there's a bunch of you know sexually explorative stories set in paris right and also love stories set in paris right right? um so that's that's like a stereotype that you attach to the french or the, the italians right um and then with the Vikings, it's a stereotype about violence mm-hmm. like oh, over and over again. And so you can just uh, essentially ask yourself, like, do I want to perpetuate that stereotype about a people? Um, is it fair to, to perpetuate stereotypes about peoples in general? Mm-hmm. Like, th- I think it's very easy for a lot of people, a lot of Americans to recognize that it's not fa- fair to perpetuate stereotypes about uh, um, indigenous peoples or black americans right like we, we don't want to do that so why do we want to do it with you know this random group of northern europeans um that there, there could be so much there could be plenty of love stories set in in the viking age and there are by the way we just don't care about them because we focus on the violence narrative right but there are, there are there's love stories that were written about uh knight this and that and his princess this and that uh, you know it takes place in the viking age mm-hmm. so they're just not as popular <laughs> yeah, yeah like when i think about it i can't really think of a single one like i no. guess the most f- famous uh scandinavian tale that any one person could name off the street would probably be beowulf um and even that's still a bit niche and how about uh, the Little Mermaid? That's Scandinavian. Yeah, <laughs> that's a Danish author. <laughs> I did know that. Yeah. Um, Although... Or, or you know, Disney's movie Frozen is based off. Yes. Of yeah. Same Scandinavian author's mm-hmm. uh, story about what the Snow Queen or whatever she's called, right? That's Hans Christian Andersen. Mm-hmm. Um, he definitely wrote love stories, mm-hmm. right? Um, but, but even so, um, yeah, Beowulf is well. It's it's English, um, but set in Scandinavia. And the right, question yeah. is like, is is it? Um, and speaking of of stereotypes, that they're really awesome, um, um, uh, animated version of Beowulf mm-hmm. uh, from two thousand seven, I think it yeah. was. With, is it? Anthony Hopkins, uh, who plays it, Rothgar. Um, he plays the king. I think so. Yeah, 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 it's yeah, him. yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I can't remember who who plays Beowulf, but but that's another great example of that same stereotype, right? Because we have this this is the beginning, the opening of the movie. We have Beowulf. He comes to Denmark, right? He mm-hmm. comes to the island of Zealand, which is like one of the flattest places on earth, and and like you see you see like these these huge Norwe- Norwegian mountains and everything. And I was like, <laughs> whoa, we've had a lot of erosion since the 700s. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like... Entire so, mountains seem to have just <laughs> slid away like, into the ocean. Okay, yes. yeah. So it's like, um, you know, when when we want to create stories about uh, that are set in a certain time period, we should ask ourselves, do we want to 
do we want to perpetuate certain stereotypes? Is it is it reasonable to do so? Um, because the truth of the matter is always that humans at any time, at any place on the planet have always been diverse, mm -hmm. right? They have always had a multitude of different emotions, interests, ideas, and and pursuits in their daily lives, right? And to, to simply cast a population wherever they're from on the planet in, in, in just like one mold is it will never do justice to who they are right mm -hmm. so, so that's essentially that uh, if you ask me so, so so that's why i would like you know if somebody asks me hey Mrs., uh what kind of uh viking movie should i make and i was like how about making a movie about um the environmental collapse and set it in the viking age well, that could be interesting i'd watch that movie <laughs> right yeah <laughs> yeah that sounds really cool and like it, it just going off of that one prompt there could be a lot to explore um and just like it's like iceland like we have discussed is very visually striking there's a lot of environment stuff going on there um it's not all about yeah. like the little humans that are running around the land just killing each other you know there's other stuff going on yeah um yeah okay that's a a very fair answer um and hopefully uh we will see viking stories in the future that aren't just about blood and guts and conquering i hope so fingers crossed <laughs> fingers crossed <laughs> all right um before i let you go um were there any uh like is there anything that you're working on that um, you want to make people aware of to look forward to? Or is there anything that you are working on that uh, people can go look at now? Well, I mean, you can always uh, listen to my podcast, the Nordic Mythology podcast that I do with uh, Daniel Farron, uh, the owner of the company Horns of Odin out of England. Um, you can find my research uh, some of it is on academia.edu others you can find at the library or google my name and you'll find something <laughs> <laughs> some some list of stuff that i've published um and uh let's see what else i, I do a lot of different things if you are uh, like myself into heavy metal you can uh, uh find me at uh, this year's midgods blood festival in norway uh where i will be doing uh among other things lectures um they have they have a whole like section for like just scholarly talks about the viking age and stuff like that Hell so yeah. yeah so that's pretty cool um and let's see what else um uh oh yeah i've like, co-founded a company with uh, a couple of friends in seattle where we uh, do eco-sustainable publishing oh so, sweet yeah so you can go check out our website we we're still you know in the very early stages you know we have some products that mm -hmm. that will soon be coming out like for instance little postcards with the viking uh runic inscriptions on them from like from the viking age and, and such things um but you can go check out the website it's uh, called hildur which is old english for elder uh spelled h-y-l-d-y-r dot com go check us out there and uh yeah that's um that's some of the stuff that I'm doing. <laughs> <laughs> the stuff that I can immediately remember. <laughs> I mean, like anyone that I've spoken to who works in academia always has a million projects going on at once. Uh, and yeah, so um, it's <laughs> it's not out of character for, for someone like you. <laughs> but yeah, um, the, uh, uh, the podcast, website, any writings, I will put all those in the show notes for our listeners to go check out. Uh, but yeah, this has been a great talk. Thank you for coming onto the show, Matthias. Yeah, thank you for having me. If you like this episode, please leave a review. It really helps the show a lot and lets me know what I can do to improve or what I should keep doing. I would really appreciate it. If you want to follow me on social media, you can follow me at Tall Leftist or at Overcritical Pod on Twitter or on Instagram at Overcritical Podcast. Thanks again for listening. 
and I'll see you all next time.